Hello, and welcome to the CDRH Industry Basics Workshop. I'm Elias Malice, the Director of the Division of Industry and Consumer Education at CDRH, and I'll serve as your moderator for the next two hours. Thanks for joining us. At the Division of Industry and Consumer Education, or DICE, it's our core vision to provide you with accurate, up-to-date, and useful information about medical devices, and in the format that best meets your needs. To get personalized feedback on specific questions about medical devices, there are two ways you can reach us. You can call us at the phone number listed here, or you can email us at dice at fda.hhs.gov. You can also check out our homepage at www.fda.gov slash dice for more info. In addition to today's Industry Basics Workshop, we've developed other educational products for you, and we encourage you to use them. If you learn most effectively by reading, then Device Advice is for you. Device Advice consists of hundreds of web pages of written information that cover a range of pre-market and post-market regulatory topics. It is truly comprehensive regulatory assistance. You can find Device Advice at www.fda.gov slash device advice. Now if you prefer a multimedia format with some audio and video, then check out CDRH Learn. This is a great catalog of videos, training modules, and audio webinars covering a wide range of discussion topics, as well as the latest in regulatory policy and hot topics. Now let's switch gears and introduce today's CDRH Industry Basics Workshop. The overall theme of today's program is the quality system regulation. Ensuring that devices are safely and effectively designed and manufactured and understanding management's role are important responsibilities you have, so we're glad to address these topics for you today. We'll follow a schedule so you can join in for the topics that you want to learn more about. Management is at the core of quality systems, so it's fitting that our first topic is management controls. Then at 2 p.m., we'll transition to today's second topic, design controls. At any time throughout the program, you may send in your questions about that topic. After each presentation, we'll have approximately 20 minutes for an interactive question and answer session with you, answering your emails as well as your phone calls. So let's get started with our program and the first topic, Management Controls. Your presenter is Tanya Wilbon, Acting Deputy Director of CDRH's Division of Industry and Consumer Education. I hope you enjoy today's program, and thanks again for joining us. Now, let's hear from Tanya. Hello, my name is Tanya Wilbon. I am the Acting Deputy Director for the Division of Industry and Consumer Education in the Office of Communication and Education at CDRH. This presentation will provide you with comprehensive fundamental information with regards to the management controls required by the quality system regulation. Management controls are important to help ensure that you provide adequate resources and that you implement and monitor an effective quality system. Quality system is also referred to as quality management system, and I'll use both terms interchangeably throughout this presentation. These are the learning objectives for this presentation. First, I'll provide some background information about management controls. Next, I'll explain the purpose of the management controls subsystem. And finally, I'll review the quality system regulation requirements for management controls. Let's begin with some background information about management controls. This diagram depicts the seven subsystems of a quality system. I'd like to point out that the management subsystem is placed directly in the middle of the diagram. It's placed there to demonstrate that management is at the core or the center of the firm's quality system. It's also placed strategically in the middle so you can physically see how management is interrelated and actually linked to all of the other subsystems that make up a firm's quality system. Management controls are critical to the effectiveness and sustainability of a firm's quality system. Of the seven subsystems I showed on the previous slide, four of them are considered major 
and management controls is one of them. It is a key quality indicator of your quality system. Management controls make up the basic foundation of your quality system, and without having such controls in place, a manufacturer will not have an effective quality management system in place. FDA considers management to be ultimately responsible for the entire quality system. FDA has defined quality system in 21 CFR Code of Federal Regulations, or CFR, 820.3V, as the organizational structure, responsibilities, procedures, processes, as well as resources for implementing quality management. With that said, manufacturers are required to implement a management controls subsystem. Let's now review the purpose of this subsystem. The management controls subsystem accomplishes several things. First, it provides adequate resources for operations within your quality management system. Examples of adequate resources are qualified individuals to perform their designated activities, equipment and supplies, both that make up the device as well as those used to manufacture the device. And finally, adequate facilities that ensure appropriate space for manufacturing. The second purpose of the management controls subsystem is to ensure that an adequate and effective quality system has been established. For example, manufacturers have to make sure that there are controlled manufacturing processes and controlled documentation per 21 CFR 820.40. Manufacturers have to control these processes to ensure the process will consistently produce the desired result. In addition, manufacturers have to make sure the equipment being used has been calibrated, inspected, and tested. The last purpose of the management controls subsystem is to monitor the quality system and make any necessary adjustments. The management representative ensures that the quality system is being monitored and that any necessary adjustments are made based on information obtained from periodic management reviews. Now that we've reviewed the background information and purpose of the management controls subsystem, let's take a closer look at its requirements found in the quality system regulation. Specific sections of the quality system regulation within the Code of Federal Regulations, or CFR, address the requirements we consider to be the essential elements of the management controls subsystem. These are management responsibility, found in 820.20, quality audit, found in 820.22, and personnel, found in 820.25. Let's take a closer look at each of these sections. First is management responsibility, which has several sections. The manufacturer must establish a quality policy and objectives. By establish, we mean define, document, and implement. This quality policy is established by management with executive responsibility. The regulation requires that the quality policy actually addresses quality and that the overall intention with respect to quality ensures that the safest and most effective products are placed on the market. The manufacturer is also required to ensure that the quality policy is understood and implemented by all employees. FDA considers management with executive responsibility to be a senior employee and has the authority to establish and change the quality policy and quality system. FDA's definition or description of management with executive responsibility is consistent with the definition in the International Organization for Standardization document, ISO 9001. The agency tries to harmonize with terminology and expectations with the rest of the world and other foreign regulators. Second, the manufacturer is required to establish and maintain an organizational structure. Remember, the definition of quality system included organizational structure. This organizational structure 
must be adequate regarding time and employees allocated for all functions identified. Manufacturers cannot have 13 different functions within the facility and only have individuals assigned to two of those functions. They must control all functions affecting device quality, including technical functions, administrative functions, or have activities that address human factors to reduce and or prevent nonconformances. This organizational structure must consider the type of device that is manufactured, as well as the organizational goals and customer needs. For example, the organizational structure of Class I and Class III medical device manufacturers may be different from each other. Small and large manufacturers may have different organizational structures. The regulation doesn't tell you exactly how the organizational structure should look, but it should reflect the types of device manufactured and organization size. While not required in the regulation, a common and best practice to document the organizational structure is to have an organization chart. Here's an example of one with multiple levels of employees. This chart looks relatively involved. This example is an indication that the organizational chart can be quite complex. It has a president at the top level, then a vice president at the second level. The third level has specific designated sections, and the fourth level depicts staffing for those sections. Manufacturers must establish appropriate responsibility and authority. This must be independent to every function affecting quality. Manufacturers must ensure that an individual assigned to a specific responsibility is appropriate for performing that activity based on level of expertise, education, training, etc. A manager cannot assign someone to address sterility if that individual does not have the necessary education and training to perform activities related to sterility. The expertise needed for a particular deliverable or task within manufacturing doesn't need to be limited to a single specialty or a standalone group. For example, a microbiological device would likely include microbiologists on the design and manufacturing teams, but may also include other specialists such as a statistician, a pediatrician, or an engineer. 820.20 requires that manufacturers provide adequate resources. As I previously mentioned, providing adequate resources is one of the purposes of the management controls subsystem. Manufacturers must develop procedures to address those resources to make sure the quality objectives may be achieved. Ensuring that personnel are trained for the particular job, role, and responsibilities is an important step in providing adequate resources. There are a few signs that FDA has used to help determine whether a manufacturer has adequate resources. If, during an inspection, FDA observes that the manufacturer was not meeting deliverables and timelines, this may be an indication of inadequate resources. Missed timelines may be due to lack of staff, equipment, or available materials. Having a high volume of non-conforming product awaiting disposition, lengthy time to resolving investigations, and lengthy time to implementing corrective actions are all indications of inadequate personnel, which is another important resource. Manufacturers are required to appoint a management representative. This must be one person who is a member of management, and the appointment must be documented. The specific name of the individual does not have to be documented, but a specific role or job description does have to be documented. The FDA investigator will request documentation that this individual has been documented. That management representative is responsible for ensuring that the quality system is established and maintained as well as for reporting on the performance 
of the quality system to management with executive responsibility. The third major management responsibility is that manufacturers conduct management reviews. Management reviews must be conducted by management with executive responsibility. They must be done with sufficient frequency as defined by the manufacturer and should ensure that management is informed of problems in a timely manner. The manufacturer should consider the outcome of internal audits to evaluate potential updates to the quality system. Management reviews must be documented. Manufacturers are required to have management review instructions and procedures that define the frequency of the reviews, ensure reviews are systematic, and ensure that all parts of the quality system are audited. The regulation does not require manufacturers to have in-person management reviews, but the procedure must document how those reviews will be done. Note that FDA will not routinely review these documents. The fourth major requirement is that manufacturers must establish a quality plan. In this quality plan, the manufacturer is required to define quality practices, resources, as well as activities. Manufacturers are required to have a quality policy as well as a plan to document all of these activities. It can be an independent document and it can reference the device master record, the quality system record, and other quality system records already in place. There is no specific format as FDA does not tell manufacturers how to establish this quality plan. The final requirement of management responsibility is that manufacturers are required to establish quality system procedures. These quality system procedures are typically general procedures that may be used throughout the quality system for specific devices. Here again, the manufacturer may want to outline the structure of the documentation and how the results will be presented, if that is required or if it's necessary. Next, we'll review the requirements for quality audit, which is found in 21 CFR 820.22. The regulation requires manufacturers to conduct a quality audit of the entire quality system and not just certain subsystems within the manufacturer's quality system. FDA does not recommend manufacturers to use the quality system inspection technique, or QCIT, as the method for conducting internal audits. This QCIT guide can be used to help guide the manufacturer. However, it is not sufficient as the method for conducting internal audits. The QCIT guide addresses four major subsystems, whereas manufacturers are required to audit the entire quality system. Quality audits ensure that the quality system is in compliance and are used to determine the effectiveness of the quality system. Audits are required to be conducted by an individual who does not have direct responsibility for the area being audited and must be conducted with a sufficient frequency. Manufacturers must take corrective action when nonconformances have been identified during the audit. The results must be reported to the management with executive responsibility and should be reviewed during management reviews. Manufacturers are required to document the date and the results of the audits and whether or not re-audits will be conducted and when. Quality audit procedures may include a number of things, such as the responsibilities for each part of the audit process, who will audit what area, the schedule of audits and auditor qualifications, when to re-audit, the scope and purpose of the audit, a checklist, and the format for presenting the results to management for review. The final section of the quality system regulation that addresses the management controls subsystem is personnel which is found in 21 CFR 820.25. This section of the regulation requires manufacturers to have sufficient personnel with necessary education, 
background, training, and experience. This will ensure that all quality system activities are performed by individuals who are qualified to do so. Manufacturers are required to determine personnel training needs and then ensure that personnel, including temporary employees, are trained. There are several ways management may determine the personnel qualifications. Management may review the employee's resume, interview the employee, or contact references about the employee's ability to perform the expected task. Finally, the regulation requires manufacturers to ensure that personnel have the necessary education, training, and background, as well as that when personnel are trained, they are made aware of device defects that can occur if they do not perform their job correctly as intended. Properly trained personnel are able to identify device defects, which in turn will help prevent non-conforming product to be released on the market. All training should be documented. The regulation specifically requires that manufacturers ensure that individuals who perform verification and validation activities be made aware of device defects during their training. After watching this presentation, I hope you have a better understanding of the regulatory requirements for management controls. In summary, management controls is one of the basic foundations of the quality management system and is considered a key quality indicator. Its purpose is to provide adequate resources, monitor and make adjustments to the quality system. Management controls involves the performing of audits of the entire quality system. The specific requirements for the management controls subsystem are codified under 21 CFR 820.20 820.22 and 820.25. And finally, FDA considers management to be ultimately responsible for the entire quality system. Management, make sure that you determine if the quality system you have in place is the one you should have. Consider whether you need to make changes to ensure that you can produce finished medical devices that are safe and effective. Make sure that you review and evaluate the entire quality system frequently to ensure it is effective. And for those staff who are not managers, make sure you inform management regularly about the state of the quality system. CDRH provides multiple opportunities for industry education. This presentation and other helpful resources are available through the Division of Industry and Consumer Education, DICE. Resources include CDRH Learn and Device Advice. In addition, the Division of Industry and Consumer Education, or DICE, answers questions by phone and email for industry and consumers related to medical devices. For additional information on these or any other medical device regulatory topics, feel free to contact DICE. Thank you for your attention. Welcome back. Thanks for viewing the presentation on management controls. I hope you found it informative. Once again, I'm Elias Malice, Director of the Division of Industry and Consumer Education in CDRH's Office of Communication and Education. I'm also joined by Tanya Wilbon, who just gave the presentation on management controls. Thank you, Tanya. Completing our expert FDA panel is Joseph Tartle from the Division of Industry and Consumer Education, as well as Eric Horowitz from CDRH's Office of Compliance. Let's now proceed with the Q&A segment of our session on management controls. You can email us your questions by clicking the Ask a Question icon which looks like a small thought bubble at the bottom of your screen. Or if you'd like to ask your question live, you can call us at 1-800-527-1401. Our next session on design controls will begin promptly at 2 p.m. So we'll try to get to as many of your questions on management controls before then. Now, let's get started with some of your emailed questions that have already come in. 
So I'll send this first question off to Joe. Um, can we use the QSIT, which is the quality system inspection technique, to conduct our quality audits and be in compliance with 21 CFR 820.22? Okay, so this is actually a question that we receive in our division from time to time. And it goes to the question of the internal audits requirements in 820.22 and the quality system inspection technique that FDA uses to do inspections. So the quality system inspection technique is a tool that FDA utilizes to do our inspections of manufacturers. And while it's a great tool to utilize to get some ideas about what to look at, it doesn't fully encompass the requirements within the internal audit requirement. So per the preamble, if you look at the preamble, and I think Tanya had it mentioned in her slides, you have to look at the entire quality system to meet that full requirement. And one of the aspects from just the practical standpoint of that is you want to look at more than just the four major subsystems. You want to get an idea internally of all the things that are going on in your quality system because you want to have a good understanding of what's going on. It would be better to find your own issues than to have FDA find them as part of an inspection. Okay. So it's one of those things where you're looking at it from that bigger standpoint, whereas FDA in QCIT is only going to – from a framework standpoint, start with those four major subsystems. So it's a good starting point, but it's not comprehensive. No, it's not comprehensive, okay. and the requirement is something that's comprehensive. And again, I think if you look back in the preamble comments, it talks specifically about that. And when I talk about the entire system, you are to audit the entire system. It's You don't have to audit it all at one time. So you actually can break it up and audit different portions during different phases throughout a year, but you want to be able to get to the entire system throughout a given time frame. The entire quality system. Yep, the, okay. your, your entire quality Excellent. system. Excellent. Uh, Tanya, is there anything else you'd like to add to that response um, from Joe? Yeah, Joe is absolutely correct in indicating that the QCIT, while it's a very useful tool to have as an initial set of, of guidelines for developing your audit procedures, it definitely would not satisfy meeting the requirements for conducting audits as required by 21 CFR 820.22. So, yeah, you want to make sure that you go beyond what's called out and what's proceduralized in the QCIT. Okay, excellent. Let's get to our next question. Um, thank you again. Please email and call us. So our next question, how does FDA determine if a quality policy is understood and implemented? So maybe, Eric, can you field that question for us? Certainly. And um, there are many ways that the FDA can really look at how well you've implemented a quality policy and how well it's really implemented within your organization. Uh, the most obvious way that an investigator looks for it is they'll go to the people on the floor and ask them, do you understand the quality policy? And that's really the important part here is not do they know it word for word, can they cite it verbatim? It's really do they know what the quality policy is intended to be communicating? Do they know really what the, uh, the quality um, expectations of their organization are? Because that's Really what we're looking for is that the employees uh, really understand um, how what they do in their job relates to what management with executive responsibility has put forward as their quality policy. And that can also be manifested through training records. It can also be manifested through um, what's in different procedures that really uh, gives an idea of how much that quality policy has really been implemented into the actual quality system so that it's not just words on a page. Okay. And it sounds like it's the management's responsibility for ensuring that all employees, regardless of their functions and role within the organization, uh, should understand and appreciate the quality policy. Mm -hmm. Correct. And to add to that, so going back, it's not a rote memorization of it. It's that you know it exists, you know where to find it, and you know, as Eric had pointed out, that what does it mean with regards to what I'm doing and what the expectations are of management to follow through on that. And I've seen firms put them on the back of their ID cards. I've seen them hang them in posters throughout, but it really gets into 
diving down into what the firm really believes as it relates to quality. And that, from a standpoint of living in it, you really want to live your quality policy. It's not just, as, as Eric pointed out, words on paper. Okay. Yes, and I, I will just add, as part of management's responsibility, I think one of the, the questions was to determine how do we determine whether or not they have ensured that this quality policy is implemented and understood. And one way is to, to determine whether or not management has made this quality policy available. And as Joe pointed out, some examples of making it available is to place it on the back of the badges as well as placing it in the hallways, any place where the staff will be able to see this quality policy and um, know that it's there and that it does exist. Okay, thank you, mm -hmm. Tonya. Our next question is about the effectiveness of training. Uh, do you have any guidance or examples on how training effectiveness may be demonstrated? Um, this is an individual, for example, who's thinking of a direct check like an exam, but also about effective application of acquired knowledge and practice. So again, this is speaking to, um, do you have any insights on measuring effectiveness of training. So maybe Tanya would like to field that question. Sure. Here again, um, the FDA, the agency does not provide you with specific ways, but some of the ways that we have seen is, as you've indicated yourself as an example, is through a direct examination. Perhaps you can um, provide a test for the staff and determine the level of, of accurate um, questions they have to address. Another way is to just um, have them to demonstrate to an overseer or supervisor, you know, a process to show that they understand the procedures that are in place. Um, and here again, checklists and traceability matrices can be used also where you're documenting exactly based on that particular position description what training needs are required and then document that they've been trained via workshops or seminars or via testing. Okay, technology. so there are a number of examples. There are a number of ways and um, we don't tell you exactly which one. And the, stakeho the stakeholder has identified several and yes. if it's appropriate then it and will it's be acceptable. It's acceptable. Yep. Okay. Correct. The important part is that you're going to qualify that person off of what training you're looking at. So as Tanya was saying, if you have a particular procedure, you might have them go through a test or you might have somebody watch the person follow through on the procedure and make sure that they understand the ins and outs of, of that aspect. Okay. And, oh, yes. and the other important aspect of it is to understand how the training of those individuals works into what they're actually performing because it's very important uh, when you're looking at how well they're training to put that into their, your monitoring system of how the actual processes that they're performing are performed so that you can really judge whether or not that training was effective in producing the results that you're looking for in real time. All right, thank you. So we have our first caller. Oh. Um, so Richard has joined our expert panel. So Richard, welcome to our program, and we'd like to hear your question. Uh, yes, hello. Um, my question is regarding uh, management review and the role of uh, management with executive responsibility. Uh, on one slide, you mentioned that the management with executive responsibility conducts the review. And my interpretation had been before that it was more of the management rep, assume with the, the review, conducts the review and is sort of giving it to the management with executive responsibility. I'm wondering your comments on how active does management with executive responsibility have to be in the meeting? Can they just receive the report and agree or disagree with the conclusions, or should they be actively involved in um, preparations and the data review, that, that sort of thing? So... I would say to that, and it depends on what you are defining as um, actively uh, reviewing or actually um, participating in the review. Management with executive responsibility is required to conduct the review, so they are required to actively participate if, if that is your description of uh, performing or, or, or participating here again in the review. So they are required to review that information that they're receiving from uh, their management representative, and they are required to weigh in on decisions 
with regards to that information. Uh, corrective actions that have been identified are and when are they required to be implemented? Has it been demonstrated that those particular corrective actions are effective? And then do they need to provide resources to ensure the implementation of those corrective actions? So they are required to actually participate in the review. Correct. And I think part of the clarification of the question was, do they have to actually prepare the information that's going into the review itself? And yes, I've seen in certain firms where the management rep is doing the preparation of gathering a lot of the data that goes into the actual review. But it's in that review that the executive, the management with executive responsibility is actively being part of it. And that's where I think Tanya is speaking about, that's where you're being actively conducting the review as part of that actual meeting with the, the rep and all that information and reviewing it. And it's very important that management with executive responsibility is really involved in that way because the important part of that is that management is really engaged that you're really showing that you're committed to the quality of uh, what you're doing and also that the, um, the quality is really driven by the way that management is portraying, uh, again, that quality policy and really building on that through the review and that management with executive responsibility is able to give that larger picture uh, kind of uh, view because that management with responsibility may be the only ones in your organization that really see how all of the different pieces fit together into one system. Richard, um, did that answer your question? Yes, uh, no, thank you very much. All right, thank you for the call. Um, so let's get back to our next emailed question. It's about uh, the quality plan. Um, what is the expected content of a quality plan, and is it product-specific or organization-specific? Um, there's a follow-up, but I want to stop there. Maybe, Joe, can you tee up this first part? I mean, the requirements for quality planning is that you're going to look forward to how you're going to meet the requirements within the regulation as well as meet the requirements with regards to the devices that you manufacture and include in that how you're going to manufacture them. So I've seen quality plans that get broken down into being device specific. I've also seen larger ones that encompass all of those. So it's not a matter of which way you do it, just that you're making sure to meet all the requirements sure. that you're trying to pull out with regards to that plan. And it might be more than just the device requirements because it's can, going to be the full system requirements. So could it actually be a blend of both org specific org across yes. the board and the commodity specific? Yep. Yes. Uh, for the, okay. So mm -hmm. the follow-up here is, can you provide a few examples of a quality plan statement? Okay. A qual a quality so Tanya, maybe? A quality plan a statement, in my opinion, would not exactly address the requirements for documenting a quality plan. Remember, your quality plan is going to um, identify and document how you as an organization plan to implement an effective quality system with regards to the design, the manufacture, the installation, um, the labeling of your finished device. So you would perhaps engage in more than documenting a statement with regards to identifying your plan. And your plan should address all of the required elements with regards to your quality system. So you can either refer to that, to those particular procedures that will address the quality system requirements, or you can actually um, proceduralize your full plan. So it will encompass more than a statement. Okay. Yeah. And, and one way of documenting that kind of thing is through some of the aspects of a quality manual. Um, uh, if that is how you choose to develop your quality plan, you really can uh, put together a manual that walks through all of the aspects of your quality system and gives all of those pointers of where things would go. And that kind of gives you an idea of what the expectation is in terms of of content if you understand what a quality plan what a quality plan is in regard to a quality manual. 
Correct. But there is no requirement to have a quality manual, Correct. but most firms do use it. And that's exactly point on that you generally develop your plan as to what you're going to do to meet all your quality system requirements. And one of the easier ways to do that is then to link that up to a quality manual. Excellent. Okay, we have a number of questions that have come in, so we'll keep firing them up. And please keep sending in your questions to us. Uh, a very interesting question. Um, here's a company who produces medical devices, um, but that's a small part of their business. So it implies they produce many things that are not medical devices. Does the quality system need to be implemented for all products, including those that are not medical devices? So maybe, Joe, your initial thoughts on that. So there's a couple ways. That the requirements for the medical device side is that it ha you have to include everything with regards to the medical devices. You could have products that are outside the scope of that. Now, what I've seen in the past is you generally want a quality system because the intent of having a quality system is to control all of the products within your firm. So you generally will have the same type of things that are cross-cutting with regards to these non-medical device products. And where you have to be very careful with, because I've worked at firms that have dealt with this, is how do those non-medical device products interact with the same equipment that may be used, okay. interact on the same production lines, because now you're not just talking about, okay, we have a medical device and we have a non-medical product, but there could be cross-contamination issues or could be other things that have to be taken into consideration. So from my standpoint, I've always included everything within the single quality system. And then when FDA would come in and do inspections, they would want to see, okay, what were the specific medical devices we were manufacturing, and then go through them. But I always would have also the knowledge that these other things that might be interacting with my medical devices were being controlled. Okay. Because there could be issues from that, that crossover. And the other thing to keep in mind is if you have products that are similar to your medical devices or even sometimes identical to the medical yep. devices just used for an indication that's not a medical device indication, um, you may gather um, quality data from those sorts of products that can be helpful towards your uh, understanding of the quality of your medical devices. So while it's not an explicit requirement, it is certainly a good idea for you to maintain um, a quality system that includes those non-medical devices so that you really can be utilizing the data as well as you can. That makes sense. Tanya, sure. any final thoughts and on I this question? I would just add, while the FDA does not prohibit you from manufacturing multiple types of products, the ones that we would enforce regulatory requirements would be those medical devices that are regulated by the agency. However, there are requirements to ensure that you're, you have environmental controls in place where perhaps you are sharing the same facility space with regards to manufacturing. And as both Joe and Eric indicated, you may at some point in time share procedures, but you have to ensure that the sharing of those procedures do not have an adverse effect on the finished product that's regulated by the FDA. All right, thank Correct. you. Correct. And on top of that, you'd also make sure that you have segregation aspects to make sure that those products are kept separate as well, so that there's no confusion of those being mixed up. And you could have a product that, for example, I'll use an IVD. You could have a product, a test assay that tests for a particular type of bacteria, say salmonella, that has an intended use for testing in food which would be a non-medical use, but that same test could then be used to test salmonella from infections of people, which then would be a medical use. And then you would want to make sure that whatever information, as Eric was pointing out, is being gathered was being gathered with regards to understanding the full capacity of that type of assay or test. So this does happen a lot, but you have to keep in context that you've got to keep things separate dependent upon if it's medical or non-medical, and then you want to utilize from a quality standpoint all the data and all the information that will help you to make a better device, a better product. Okay, thank you. So our next question goes back to training. Okay. Training is very important. Training is important. How long are you required to keep all your training records? Um, for example, production operators, technicians, buyers, etc. 
Uh, do you need to keep all your training records for the life of the device? So Eric would like to field that question. So training records are a quality record. Um, and so as such, they fall under the same requirements for maintaining records that you do for other aspects of your quality system. And so that requirement for record keeping, which is that it should be throughout the lifespan of the device and no less than two years, applies just as much to training records as it does to uh, any other aspect of your quality system. Okay. All right. Our next question, um, how do we make sure that management understands uh, its responsibility? How do, you, how do you make sure that management understands its responsibilities? Number one, I would say by ensuring that they are apprised of webinars that the FDA <laughs> offers in which we try to um, assist and provide training with regards to our intent and implementation of the regulations that we require medical device manufacturers to um, uh, implement. But the other way, it's very similar. Management is considered employees or staffing within um, your organization. So uh, demonstrating their level of understanding their requirements is quite uh, similar to the way you would any other employee. It just has to be documented. You can do that by even uh, providing management with a test, by you know having management to explain to you their understanding of their requirements and their responsibilities. So demonstrating management's training needs and their um, understanding of their roles is similar as any other employee because they are actually still an employee of that organization. Okay. There's no difference. There's a, there's a part B to this. Okay. Um, but I like to frame the question. I'll state it, then I'll maybe reframe it. Sure. What measures may, can be taken so that they really understand their role? And I guess what I, I want to interpret that mm -hmm. this is a non-manager employee of the organization asking this question. So mm -hmm. what could a non-manager do to help ensure that their management understand. So maybe with that context, Joe, what would you well, your advice? One of the, the intents of the quality system is it's a top-down approach. It starts at the very top. As um, we were looking at the presentation that was run, as well as if you look at the QCID guide, management is at the center of all of the subsystems because the importance of management is that they're the ones with the responsibility and authority to make change and to have impact <laughs> on the organization. Um, also, another way that you can point back to your management with regards to their responsibilities is the interaction that the agency is going to have with your firm is going to be at the highest level of management. So when they come in to do an inspection and they issue the 42 notice for inspection, the people they're going to want to talk to is the the highest level person. So one of the things, if I were a staffer at a firm, I would say, when FDA comes to inspect us, they're going to ask for you. They're going to come mm -hmm. and want to talk to you about the system. And right there, that should kind of push some seriousness yes. onto this as to what your role is with regards to this and the regulations and the law. And uh, one thing, uh, if it is an individual who's not executive management, who's trying to influence um, how management views all of this that can be done is that the, that management representative, uh, the one that you're required to have uh, to look at, be kind of that gateway between management and the quality system is a very important resource because that's really the person who you should be able to go to to say, hey, this is what I'm seeing about our quality system. This is what we really need to be doing. I need a way of really communicating that to executive management. And it's really that management representative's responsibility to be that gateway and to really enable you to be able to uh, bring that up with executive management. Correct, and that's why executive management names that person. The intent, yes. there, there was a reason why that intent was put there is executive management names that person. So perhaps um, for that person who wrote in and you're an employee, maybe you can um, suggest that your executive managers watch this program. It's going to be recorded and available on our CDRH Learn uh, website, so have them um, watch this program. And from Eric, <laughs> talk to your management rep. And talk to your management rep. Okay. 
Let's continue. Uh, how frequently should management reviews be conducted? And is there a minimum frequency that the FDA will consider to be adequate? For example, monthly, quarterly, SAMA, annually, annually, every two years, et cetera. So is there a... Is there a simple answer to this question, Tanya? Well, of course, there's never a simple answer, but the actual answer is here again. The agency does not um, give you a definitive frequency with, within which to conduct your management reviews. It is dependent upon the complexity of the device that you are manufacturing as well as the size and the complexity of your organization. However, there, is, there are certain um, aspects or criteria that the agency indicates you should consider, things like how frequently or how um, fast will management be notified in the event you have some nonconformances or your quality system isn't functioning and, and isn't as effective and efficient as it should be. Management should be apprised of that as expeditiously as possible. And if that is not being done, perhaps that's an indication that you can use to say, you know, we need to conduct management reviews more often. Um, however, also, in addition, I would say that the agency's expectation is that you should not conduct those um, no less than 12 months or within a year. No so at least annually. Okay. Correct. And that's for lower risk, simpler type of devices Correct. as well. Yes. The minimum is right. once every 12 months. Okay. Um, next question. Do all employees need to be trained on the quality plan? So, Eric, your thoughts? Uh, on the quality plan. The quality plan. <laughs> Yes, all employees should be trained on the quality plan um, because that quality plan is is going to interact with what, how all employees do their job. They need to be trained on it to understand how they fit into the quality system. Now, that doesn't mean that every employee needs to be trained on the quality plan the same way. Um, certain employees may have more need to know about certain areas than others, um, but they should all have an idea of how everything fits together so that they understand how they fit into the bigger picture. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Um, our next question, since we are a small firm, are we required to have an auditor include someone who does not have direct responsibility for the area audited? So, Tanya, maybe... Your thoughts on this question? Yes, certainly. We, we do get that question often um, where firms consider themselves too small to, to engage or have someone that does not have direct um, authority over that area that they need audited. But the regulation does require that all manufacturers have a designated an independent um, individual to conduct audits of an area that they do not have authority on. And that's to ensure the independence of that audit. You should be gaining and acquiring as much useful information as possible from your audits to know where to improve your quality system to ensure you continue to manufacture um, devices that are safe and effective. It also um, indicates or provides an opportunity to not have those audits to be biased. You know, you have someone who doesn't have direct um, authority over that area. They're going to do a more um, uh, less biased or, or uh, less um, more honest of a, of a job. It'll be more accurate. You have more information that's more uh, actual as to what your quality system looks like. Um, you can, as a small manufacturer, if you do not have that level of independence, you can engage in, in um, uh, consulting with a contract um, auditor. You can hire out a third party to conduct those audits. But the expectation is the requirement is still there that regardless of the size of your facility, you are required to have that independent auditor. Okay. Correct. And that expectation is mm -hmm. actually written into the preamble as well. That yes. was one of the preamble comments that came up, and you can see the dialogue of... Um, industries and FDA's thinking at that time, and it actually addresses that specific point in the comments. And, and the one point that I want to make about uh, getting contractors to do those sorts of audits and are both that um, that contractor is a supplier. They should be part of your supplier controls. Um, and that the it's not enough to have somebody who's come in to do an ISO audit and you just assume that because you 
got through your ISO audit, that means that your audit is complete. Um, you really need to have someone who's looking at this for the expressed purpose of doing an audit of your quality system for your requirements. And that's your requirements under A20.22. And mm -hmm. that's a great point with regards to the ISO side of things is under your purchase controls, you would come in, you would make sure that they're qualified with regards to the quality system regulation, um, quality audit aspect. Yes, and that's a great point that Joe brings up. They, they are required to be qualified to conduct that audit of the area that they are auditing. So if you're not qualified and knowledgeable um, about that particular area, then you would not be deemed a qualified individual to perform that task. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these have been great questions. We have a time for maybe one or two questions, and then okay. we'll wrap up so we can go on to the next segment. Okay. Here's an interesting question that's come in through email. If a site has both a global corporate oversight responsibility as well as local, a local manufacturing function, how should management reviews be conducted? So that's the first part. Um, so perhaps, Eric, can you comment on that? Sure. And there isn't one specific way that management reviews can be conducted. Um, a lot of times what we've seen is that there are multiple levels of management review. So you've got executive management with executive responsibility at the facility level performing a, a management review to have the, the real um, ability to look at the quality system of that specific facility. And you also have management review at the corporate level um, where really the corporate executive management is looking at the health of the quality system for their entire corporation and really looking at how the different facilities work off of each other. And it's very important to have both aspects reflected, um, but there isn't one specific way of doing that. Right, and, and here again, I would just like to reemphasize that it, it really does depend on the complexity of the device that you are engaging management reviews on if you need some additional input. And here you as the manufacturer get to define that. You know, how much input do I only need input from management at the, the satellite or the local facility, or do I really need the heavy hitters that are at the overarching, you know, main manufacturing facility to provide these resources to ensure that we have an effective and suitable um, quality system in place. So it really depends on the needs of those, the outcomes of those reviews. Okay. Right. And if I can add one more sure. thing to sure. that, one of the things that can help flush this out too is looking at where are, do you have one overarching quality system? Do you have multiple quality systems and how are they being looked at from an internal audit standpoint? And is that you know, separate internal audits that are covering individual quality systems, or do you have something that's using an internal audit to cover several? And that might help you answer that question a little bit better. Excellent. So I think that'll be our last question for this program. I'd like to turn over to Tanya for your final thoughts for our audience about uh, management controls. Sure. And as a reminder, um, management, I would like to say to you, make sure that you evaluate um, your quality system for its suitability and effectiveness. And then after that evaluation is done, decide whether or not your quality system is still maintaining and performing as it should. And if not, make those changes and document that those changes have been done. I, someone voiced the concern with regards to ensuring that um, management is qualified and is implementing quality system requirements as deemed. And I would say continue to, to challenge those qualifications and those um, activities that are being done by your management. Management, you are ultimately responsible, as was indicated. FDA will address you initially with regards to the effectiveness and the suitability of your quality system. All right. Thank you, Tanya, and thank okay. you, panelists. Um, this will wrap up our session on management controls. Um, thank you all for sending in all of your great questions. Remember, if we didn't get to your questions or if you have fu future questions for us, please contact us at the Division of Industry and Consumer Education at DICE. We've posted a survey about this workshop at our website where you can access the program, and we welcome your feedback 
and this will help us improve how we serve your educational needs in the future. We really like to hear from you, so please fill out the survey. It will be available for several weeks, and it will just take a few minutes to complete. Now, let's get to today's second topic, design controls. Your presenter for this topic will be Joseph Tartle. At the conclusion of his presentation, we'll bring back the expert panel for an interactive question and answer session with you. See you in a little while. Hello. Design controls are important. In my experience, I have found that how things start are how they go. And this is also true when bringing a medical device to market. If you begin with effective design controls, you dramatically increase your ability to meet user needs and ensure your device will be safe and effective. My name is Joseph Tartle, and I'm the Post-Market and Consumer Branch Chief in the Division of Industry and Consumer Education. I have designed medical devices while working in an industry, and I understand the difficulties of bringing a medical device to market. Having worked at FDA, I understand the importance of design controls in ensuring that all medical devices are safe and effective. When design controls are established correctly, we all share in the benefits that the right medical device was brought to market and that it meets user needs, its specifications, and it works as intended. By the time I'm finished, I want you to know the following learning objectives. Understand the importance of design controls in device quality and in the quality system regulation. Know the quality system regulation requirements for design controls and learn how its sections interact with one another and the rest of the quality system. And finally, understand the continual role that design controls play in both pre-market and post-market device development. Design controls are a set of quality practices and procedures incorporated into the design and development process. They are a systematic way to assure that medical devices meet user needs, intended use needs, and all specified requirements, thereby ensuring the medical device is safe and effective. They are a directed controlled action, something you do. They are not retrospective. Properly established design controls can improve your medical device and prevent foreseeable issues and problems both in the device and in device manufacturing. Why were the design controls added to the quality system regulation when the current good manufacturing practices were revised? From the fiscal year 1983 to the fiscal year 1989, FDA conducted a six-year study to determine the causes of voluntary recalls. What the study found was that 44% of all voluntary recalls could have been prevented if adequate design controls were used. Basically, poor design was a leading cause of voluntary recalls. For to another study performed on recall data from fiscal year 2003 to fiscal year 2012, and design is still cited as one of the most frequent causes of recalls. That tells us that design has an important and direct real-world impact on device quality, safety, and effectiveness. Many post-market problems with medical devices can be traced back to poor design. As I noted earlier, how it starts is how it goes. After the recall study of the 1980s, there were discussions between the medical device industry, FDA, and Congress about the inclusion of pre-production requirements in the current good manufacturing practices. Industry was concerned that such requirements would stifle research, while FDA wanted to ensure that once research entered into a development phase, the development would be defined and controlled. With the passage of the Safe Medical Device Act of 1990, FDA was given authorization by Congress to add design control requirements to medical devices. They were subsequently written into the 1996 Quality System Regulation, which became effective June 1, 1997. The preamble to the regulation provides a lot of useful information about industry's concerns at the time, FDA's intent, and the context for design control expectations. 
Design controls are codified in the Code of Federal Regulation 820.30. FDA uses a risk-based approach with the application and requirement for design controls. Design controls apply to all Class II and Class III medical devices. Design controls also apply to a small number of Class I medical devices. They are medical devices automated with computer software, tracheobronchial suction catheters, surgeon's gloves, protective restraints, manual radionuclide applicator systems, and sources for radionuclide teletherapy. Now that we know what types of medical devices require design controls, when should they begin? Manufacturers should document the flow of the design process so that it is clear where research ends and design begins. Per the preamble, they are not intended to apply to development of concept and feasibility studies. A good rule of thumb is that design controls begin after feasibility and when the decision has been made to bring the medical device to market. They are required prior to any investigational device exemption and are pre-market. They are also used when design changes are made to the device. Again, design controls are not intended to be retroactive. Next, I will review the quality system regulatory requirements for design controls. Since we now know when, the question becomes where to start. I recommend starting with design planning. Planning is important as both a requirement and a practical tool to control the design process. Establish, which means define, document, and implement the following. First, describe or reference design and development activities to keep track of all requirements, their status, and completion. Next, identify, describe, and define interfaces, responsibilities, functions, and activities that impact the device design. I recommend using cross-functional teams with appropriate representations from all parts of the organization. Define who has what responsibility and the authority to make decisions. Last, review, document, approve, and update the plans as development and design changes evolve. The plan will provide a roadmap of where the design is and where it is going and help to make it an efficient and effective process. Once there's a plan, then start with design inputs. Design inputs are the physical and performance characteristics of a device that are used as a basis for the device design. Questions to consider at this stage are, who are the users, what are the user needs, in what environment is the device intended to be used, and what other kinds of devices will it be used with. Manufacturers are required to establish and maintain procedures for design input to ensure requirements are appropriate by addressing user needs and intended uses in terms that are measurable. Also, any incomplete, ambiguous, or conflicting requirements must be addressed. Last, document, review, and approve all design input requirements. Now, let us use an example to further illustrate a design input. We can take a user need such as portable and further narrow it down to the end user must hand carry the device. To define this aspect of portable into a measurable specification, we can use criteria such as dimensions and weight. We can have the design input for a weight specification be five pounds plus or minus one kilogram. Next, we must address any incomplete, ambiguous, or conflicting requirements. For example, we cannot use a conflicting unit of measure such as five pounds plus or minus one kilogram. The measurable specification must use a single unit of measure, for example, pounds. The design input is now a specification of five pounds plus or minus one pound. Last, the design input is documented, reviewed, and approved. The design inputs should also include human factors. Human factors are the study of the interactions between humans and the device, such as the interface end users and patients have with the device and the subsequent design of that interface. 
This is important since human factors can lead to improved ease of use, appropriate instructions for use, increased proper use, and decreased use error. Also, human factors can help to increase the device reliability, durability in life, and decrease maintenance and repair. Last, taking human factors into consideration during design can lead to fewer adverse events and recalls. Design inputs can come from many sources, such as customers, standards, guidance documents, complaints, and adverse event reports, to name a few. Examples of design inputs from these sources can include device functions, physical characteristics, performance, safety, and reliability among those listed and others that are not. Spending enough time up front capturing the right information to develop design inputs will help to get your design process off to a successful start. Design outputs are the results of a design effort at each design phase and at the end of the total design effort. In general, design outputs are the design specifications which must meet design input requirements as confirmed during design verification and validation and ensured during design review. The finished design output is the basis for the device master record or DMR. The total finished design output consists of the device, its packaging, labeling, and the device master record. Also, manufacturers must identify essential design output for the proper functioning of the device. Using our previous design input example of a weight specification, one design output would be the physical handheld device itself that weighs five pounds plus or minus one pound. Last, manufacturers are required to review, approve, and document design outputs before release. Design outputs are included as part of a pre-market submission as device specifications. And a pre-market submission, such as a 510K or pre-market approval, could be included as a design output. Establish and maintain procedures for design reviews. Plan and conduct formal documented design reviews of the design results at appropriate stages. Design reviews are not ad hoc meetings. They are documented, comprehensive, and systematic. Manufacturers determine the frequency and stages for design review. For a more complex and higher risk device, more design reviews will be needed. While for a simple, lower risk device, fewer or a single design review may be acceptable. At each design review, include representatives of all functions involved specialists as needed, and at least one individual without direct responsibility for the stage being reviewed. During the review, evaluate the adequacy of the design requirements and the capability of the design to meet those requirements. Identify and correct any problems that need to be resolved. Document results of the design review in the design history file, or DHF, and include the identification of the design, the date, and the names of the individuals performing the review. Design verification is confirmation by objective evidence the design output meets design input. Manufacturers are required to establish and maintain procedures for design verification. Continuing on with our example, I can use a calibrated scale to weigh the device from my design output, and using the measurement on the scale, I can verify the device weighs five pounds, plus or minus one pound. The design output meets the design input and is verified and confirmed by measurable means. The verification is reviewed, approved, and documented as part of the design history file. The next section that follows design verification is design validation. Design validation is establishing, again, by objective evidence that specifications conform to user needs and intended uses. Manufacturers are required to establish and maintain procedures for design validation. These procedures must include performing the design validation under defined operating conditions, 
on initial production units or their equivalent and under actual or simulated use conditions. If the plan is to use equivalent production units or simulated use conditions, then the manufacturer must also document how these units are equivalent to initial production units and how the simulated use conditions are similar to the real world conditions. Think about verification and validation in this way. Design verification. Does the design output meet the input? The design output the device is measured on a scale and weighs 5 pounds plus or minus 1 pound, which is the specification as noted in the design input. I made the product correctly. This is in contrast to design validation, where the 5 pound device is put into the actual use environment with the intended users and they confirm that it is portable. Using the example, the intended users can carry the device by hand in the intended use environment. Therefore, the intended use and user needs for portable are met. I made the correct product. Both are important to the design process. Continuing on with design validation, risk analysis is noted one time in the quality system regulation and it's in design validation. Risk is noted many times throughout the preamble. Design validation shall include software validation and risk analysis where appropriate. Where appropriate means it is appropriate unless the manufacturer can document a justification for why it is not appropriate. It's almost always appropriate to perform risk analysis. It will likely take more effort to justify why it's not appropriate to perform a risk analysis than not doing so. Also, while risk analysis is noted in design validation, it's more practical to perform initial risk analysis earlier during design input. Then, as more information and data are gathered, the initial risk analysis is updated. That being said, what does FDA mean by risk analysis? Regardless of the risk analysis tool used, the preamble is clear that manufacturers are to identify possible hazards, including use errors, evaluate and calculate the risk under both normal and fault device operating conditions, determine the risk acceptability, reduce all unacceptable risks to acceptable levels, and ensure those changes do not introduce new hazards. This is the expectation for risk analysis in order to meet the regulatory requirement. While risk analysis is the regulatory requirement, the current industry practice goes one step further and utilizes risk management. This slide shows two resources that will help you better understand risk management. The first is a guidance document titled Implementation of Risk Management Principles and Activities within a quality management system. It was written by the Global Harmonization Task Force, which has since been replaced by the International Medical Device Regulator Forum. And the second is ISO 14971, which is the standard for the application of risk management to medical devices. ISO 14971-2007 is an FDA recognized voluntary consensus standard. Now that the design team has done a great job and verification and validation activities are complete, can we just throw it over the wall to our manufacturing staff? No. Manufacturers are required to establish and maintain procedures to ensure that the correct design is transferred into production. From a practical standpoint, there's a real need to address production scale-up issues the completion of process validation protocols, finalization of purchasing controls, and training and qualifying manufacturing personnel, among other transfer considerations. This is one area where design controls interact with other parts of the quality system, and a worst case scenario is to have an effectively designed device not manufactured correctly. And while design transfer should happen throughout the design process, Frequently, there is a final stage of development intended to ensure all outputs are adequately transferred to production. 
The term I have heard used to stop the continuation of a design is a design freeze. Over time, the one thing I can guarantee is that things will change. Next, I'll discuss the continual role design controls play in pre-market and post-market device development. This will also include the rest of the quality system regulatory requirements for design controls. Manufacturers are required to establish and maintain procedures for the identification, documentation, validation, or where appropriate, verification, review, and approval of design changes before their implementation. Make sure there is a system in place to enact future changes. As a device is improved or more information becomes available after it's on the market, there has to be a system for change. Also, depending on its scope and impact, the change may require a pre-market submission, such as a new 510K, a new PMA, or a PMA supplement. Last, let's discuss the design history file, or DHF. This is a compilation of records which describes the design history of a finished device. It's a record of all design actions from start through transfer, including any changes. It's the totality of the entire design effort for the life of the device. Manufacturers are required to establish and maintain a design history file for each type of device. The DHF can be specific to a single device or a family of devices. Include in the DHF the information necessary to demonstrate that the design was developed in accordance with the design plan and the quality system requirements. It can be a single notebook, several books, or an index reference to other records. The design history file becomes very important as researchers, engineers, quality and regulatory personnel leave, and time goes by and activities completed years ago become a memory. Additional information on design control guidance and human factors can be found at the links on this slide. In concluding this presentation, I now ask you to take on the following call to action. Meet your regulatory requirements for design controls per 21 CFR 820.30. Use cross-functional teams to design your device. Ensure your design controls address user needs and intended use and define appropriate device specifications. And last, use design controls to build quality, safety, effectiveness, and savings into your medical device. This presentation and other helpful videos and educational resources can be found at CDRH Learn. For text-based information on pre-market and post-market topics, including how to bring a medical device to market, please visit Device Advice. For additional information on these or any other medical device regulatory topics, feel free to call us at the Division of Industry and Consumer Education Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for watching. Welcome back, and thanks for viewing the presentation on design controls. Once again, I'm Elias Malice. We're joined by your presenter, Joseph Tartle. Thank you, Joe, for your comprehensive overview presentation. Completing our expert FDA panel is once again Tanya Wilbon from CDRH's Office of Communication and Education and Eric Horowitz from CDRH's Office of Compliance. Let's now proceed with the Q&A segment of our session on design controls. You can email us your questions by clicking the Ask a Question icon, which looks like a small thought bubble at the bottom of your screen. Or if you'd like to ask your question live, you can call us at 1-800-527-1401. The session will go all the way to 3 p.m., so we'd love to answer as many of your questions about design controls before then. Now let's get started with some of your emailed questions that have already come in. So this first question, I'll send it to Eric. When do design controls 
apply, and how will I know? So this is spoken up about a little bit in the preamble, and um, what the preamble says is it's not the intent of the FDA for design controls to interfere with innovation and research. Um, so during that research phase where you're really uh, feeling out what kind of products you might be, be making and doing kind of feasibility to figure out um, exactly where you should be going with things, that's not where you're required to have design controls. But as soon as you've reached the point where you have a product that you're going to eventually put to market, um, that is when design controls really need to kick in, um, is really during the development of a product that is eventually going to actually be a medical device that goes to market. Okay, thank you. And, and also, Tanya, yes. I'll add that one cue that you can use is once you've identified a particular design input and you're ready to review that input and actually have approved it, then you should have your design control activities in place and proceduralized. Excellent. All right, let's get to our next question. We have a sponsor um, who is manufacturing a medical device, but he's currently conducting an, an IRB, which is an investigational review board, um, approved clinical study for that medical device. The question is, who is ultimately responsible for the quality system? So Tanya, any, your thoughts on that question? Sure, so the quality system is the responsibility of the finished device manufacturer. So whomever decides that they want to submit that particular finished device to the FDA through their regulatory pathway, either uh, pre-market notification pathway or pre-market approval um, pathway, then they would be responsible. Uh, with regards to the quality system, um, IRB gets involved when they are approving an IDE, that's an investigational device exemption, with regards to those devices that you want to conduct the clinical investigation on. And it really gives the manufacturer a pathway to ship those particular products to conduct those investigations. Those particular products at that point in time are not required to comply with the quality system regulation other than those design control requirements under 21 CFR 820.30. So if you have an investigational device exemption or an investigation device, you're only required to have in, uh, have in uh, in procedures, quality system requirements for design controls. And the IRB would have to approve that. FDA would also have to approve that IDE if it's considered a significant risk device. And if the product is not significant and riskly studied? Then you still have to obtain IRB, IRB approval. You do not have to obtain FDA approval. And this is actually listed out in the IDE regulation yes. itself in 812. So in okay. 21 CFR 812, it specifically um, puts that in place that you are exempt from the GMP quality system requirements except for 820.30 design, design controls. controls. Yes. And Eric? to add to that aspect about ultimately responsible, um, when it comes to quality systems and the way that the regulation speaks of it, there isn't a concept of ultimately responsible. Um, really, if you have a specification developer and a finished device manufacturer, both are responsible for ensuring the quality of that design. Um, there isn't one who is more responsible or or uh, one who is, quote unquote, ultimately responsible. And that's based on the definition of a, of a manufacturer defined in 21 CFR 820.3. And so it's defined as a specification developer and a finished device manu manufacturer are both defined as manufacturer. So they are both required to implement the applicable portions of the quality system regulation. Under 820. Under 820. So the Part B of this, I think we answered it, but just to make sure it's clear, sure. um, the, the individual asks, um, is the responsibility that of the manufacturer or of the business who contracted the manufacturer? Right. So, 
So here again, it would be the responsibility of if the individual who contracted the manufacturer is the entity that will submit that fin information that supports the safety and effectiveness of that particular finished device um, to the agency for approval or for clearance, depending on the classification of it, then they would be the ones who are responsible. The person who will be submitting the marketing application? Yes. Okay. And they would have to have those controls in place to ensure their contracting manufacturer has uh, complied with quality system requirements. Okay. That's a, a great question. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. And please continue to send us your email questions or call us. So let's get to our next question. Um, Joe asked this for you to answer. What is the expectation of maintaining and updating the design history file, or DHF, after the product has been transferred to manufacturing or is in commercialization? Okay, so as, we, as I talked about during the presentation, when you go through your design transfer, you're going to have your design history file. It is going to be something that continues on, and it's something that's going to live for the life of the device. And this gets into the record keeping requirements with regards to that file that it's going to live as long as you're still manufacturing that device and that device is still out on the marketplace. And it's the requirement for any of these files is the life or no less than two years. Now, from a design history file standpoint, too, you're going to look at do you have similar devices because the design history file could be a single device or it could be a family of devices or it could be an evolution of a device over time. Any of the devices that evolved off of that device, you're going to keep that design history file, both from a requirement standpoint but also from the standpoint that you want to look back and see the design over the entire life because changes are going to occur. And that's another reason why that requirement is in place after you've transferred into production and gone into distribution is you're going to have design changes. Things are going to happen. Maybe they're not going to happen next year or two years or three years, but at some point changes are going to occur. And those changes have to be also included as part of that design history file. Okay. And um, as Joe said, um, your design control process really needs to be a living process uh, throughout uh, the production of whatever product it is that you're making. And that information that's in the design history file is imperative when you get information in that you're looking at through your corrective and preventive action uh, system to look at, um, you know, do we have some sort of design issue going on here, uh, and really to identify what the potential causes of non-conforming products or of other kinds of quality issues may be. Um, so it's very important that that design history file continues to live on um, in order to be a very useful tool. Correct. And one of the places I've seen the importance of that is risk. So what I've seen where firms have faltered is they've done some great risk analysis activities as part of the design, and then later on after distribution, as part of a corrective action or a trend in complaints that become a corrective action, they identify a new risk and don't connect the two and go back and say, oh, did we identify this in the initial risk assessment or not? And what you want to do as a firm is you want to go back and look at that and see, did we capture it? And if we did capture it, did we correctly identify both the severity and the probability of that happening? All right. Thank you, panelists. So we have our first caller. He's called in with a question. So, um, Chris, thank you for joining us. Um, you're live with the FDA expert panel. Um, so um, please share us your question. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is concerning design uh, transfer to production spec, where where you. Joseph had stated that you would go from transferring all your design information to the production spec. I'm assuming that's all outputs. I've heard that on that output, would that involve into the device master record? I've heard that would be normally in the design output part. Which version is correct, the design after the design output or the design transfer? So the design output becomes a one of the design outputs becomes that device master record, and that device master record is used as part of the transfer. So when you think of a device master record, you think about all the recipes, all the formulations, all of the items that go in to understand how to do the actual production of the device itself. 
So the device master record is used as a design transfer tool because if I have a perfect, and I'm talking theoretically, if I have a perfect device master record, I could go to any contract manufacturer who had similar type of equipment, trained personnel, and make that device. So I generally looked at it as you'll have a design output that, one of those design outputs will be your device master record, and that device master record would then be used as part of a tool in your design transfer. Yes, I would concur with that. Yep. Chris, um, thank that you for the question. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. All right, thank you for joining us. So let's continue with our next emailed question. Uh, it's a short one. Uh, Joe, for you, can design controls be retroactive? Okay, so I know I talked a little bit about this in the presentation, and generally they're not supposed to be retroactive from June 1st, 1997. So what happened is design controls came into a requirement of the quality system regulations when it was rewritten in 1996 and then was implemented June 1st, 1997. And what they said 20 years ago is, if you had been working on a product, we're not asking you to go back in time and redo the design. But anything after June 1st, 1997, the expectation is that design controls are not going to be retroactive from that standpoint. Also, if you had devices on the market at that time, any design changes that occurred from that point on are supposed to be taken into consideration. So while you were not required to do anything retroactive prior to that date on design, if you made design changes from that date forward, you are supposed to do that. And the intent is, and the preamble actually talks about the whole aspect of doing this up front, is you don't want to lose out at the end of product development the aspect of really understanding that design process. And that design process is what is important to make sure that the safety and efficacy of those devices are being taken into consideration, and they go everything from the user needs to the intended use to the particular specifications related to that. So from a retroactive standpoint, if I were designing a device today, I'm supposed to do design controls from the standpoint point, that, yes, moving forward. Yep. Eric, you wanted to follow up? And, and to add to that, um, if you are in one of those instances where really you have to do retroactive uh, design controls because it's really the only choice you have in front right. of you, um, if you're going to use historical data in order to do that, you need to be very mindful of exactly how you're using that data. Um, because if, if um, that data is being used in an unmindful way uh, where you're just picking and choosing the data that will show what you want your design controls to have shown, then you haven't really accomplished anything. You've just reaffirmed in your head that this is the correct design. You really need to have a well-thought-out plan for exactly how you're going to perform those retroactive uh, activities. Correct. And the, the example I've seen this come up with, because we receive this question from time to time, is I have bought a device from a different manufacturer, and after we transitioned over the 510K and other pieces, we found out that, A, they don't have a design history to follow, and B, they didn't do their design controls. Now what do I do? And generally, the answer that Eric gave is what we mm -hmm. generally recommend. All right. Thank you, panelists. We have our second caller who's come in. Um, so thank you, Samir. Um, you, you are on with the FDA expert panel. Thank you for joining us, and please share your question with us. So 21 CFR 820.321 requires design controls for Class 1 devices that are automated with computer software. I know Joe talked about the other Class 1 devices that require design controls, but for what does a Class 1 device automated with computer software mean? Does it mean that any Class 1 device that has a slight bit of software is subject to design controls? Yes, it does. So if your finished device has some type of uh, computer system or um, technological software that, that um, helps to carry out the intended use of that device or is part of that finished device, it is required to have design controls in place. And the preamble actually talks a little bit about this as well because it gets into that concept of if there's some software within the device, then it does require design controls, even if it's class one. Yes. Um, Samir, did that answer your question? 
Yes, I, yes, that answers the I question. Mean, Thank did, you. Did you have a follow up to that, or? Well, I was just thinking like mobile apps. If you have mobile apps, then and I know the mobile app guidance recommends design controls, but doesn't require it. So. All right. So that's a whole different. Um, scenario and unless my colleagues here want to address that I will refer you to uh, um, our colleague John Murray with regards to the mobile apps unless the two of you want to speak on that um, I would just say uh, to refer to the guidance about exactly what to do uh, with mobile apps and what different situations with mobile apps require um, and uh, I just wanted to add uh, with respect to uh, devices that are automated with software in a more general sense, um, the importance of really having as part of your design validation, validation of that software specifically. I like that. Uh, this is uh, a great question. Um, Samir, thank you for your, your question on this. I do want to ask one final follow-up. So the reg was written many years ago, and at that time there was the wisdom to pull out certain class one devices, including those with automated software. Um, can you talk a little bit to the context of why we chose to do that for, for this category of class one devices? Right. Well, with regards to that, the intent and the thinking at that time was that softwares are so, software is so unpredictable that you're going to always have some type of changes that are taking place and you want to make sure you account for those and then um, address whether or not those changes with those multiple with the change multiple changes with the software does not adversely affect the overall intended use of that finished device so because there's inherent um, software change that perhaps could take place with regards to software we want to make sure that you have those design controls in place so that you can have that information historically um, for future reference. Correct. And it, really the intent had to do with the risk and complexity of the devices. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at the risk and complexity of a device, by adding software to it, you're changing that complexity level. All right. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. And it's a good question, and it, it also speaks to with emerging policies, such as with mobile apps, mm -hmm. um, yes. stick to the more specific guidance um, on that topic yes. to understand how that um, is superimposed upon the yes. foundational regulations mm -hmm. that apply to all medical devices. Yes. We have our next caller. So uh, this is a pretty lively session with calls. Um, so um, uh, thank you for joining us, caller um, Harsh. Um, you're here with the um, FD Expert panel. Please share us with your question. Hi. Uh, so I have a question then, at what time the change control kicks in in a design control process for a new product as well as a product which is in the market? Thank you. Okay, so if I heard the question. It was you have a product that's already on the market, it's gone through design, and now you have a change to that product. When do you have to do change with regards to your design controls? It really speaks to what that change is and how that change is looked at with regards to the device. And you want to, at any point where you have a change to the device, you want to deal with it through the design control process because those design changes and the, the aspect of the design changes you want to be able to capture. And I'll add that prior to having that device on the market, you should already have those design change control procedures in place. So you should already have a process in place that those changes must go through in order to um, be implemented prior to putting that product back on, the, on the, the market with those changes. So make sure you have your design control, design change control procedures in place as well. And those procedures, as Joe indicated, would depend upon the complexity and the change that you actually make. And also included in your design change control procedures include decisions with regards to whether or not you should submit those changes to the finished device through the regulatory pathway. And if I understood the question correctly, uh, an aspect of that was also how should you handle design changes that happen prior to market when you have a new product that is still under development. Okay. And that kind of situation, um, you really, 
both need to look at from a design change aspect and from the development aspect. Um, and so you don't necessarily have to put that through the same process that you would use for design changes after market, but you need to have a process in place for how you do handle those changes because um, if you make a change to a design output, for instance, while you're in design verification, you may have unintentionally changed something else about the device that you, there are other aspects of design controls that you need to go back and revisit. And so while, while it's possible to do that through your design and development process initially, you still do need to be very mindful of those changes and how you're going to handle them. Correct. And one of the things that I've seen done, too, with firms is they will stop at a particular area to get the design product through design validation and out on the market, and those occurring changes that are still happening, because researchers, engineers love to add things and keep putting things to improve the device, that will be the next model number, but it will go back through the initial design process again with those added changes and those new things, because at some point, you want to get that device out onto the marketplace. And you have certain groups within the company saying we were expected to launch, you know, yesterday. <laughs> so you'll generally, what I've seen done is they'll split off and you'll have the model that goes through validation and then the other model with the continual changes will become the next generation. And I just want to add, Eric did bring up a great point with regards to your design change control procedures may differ, or it can actually be the same, but oftentimes you see the difference with regards to those changes made to your devices prior to the device being um, placed on the market versus those changes um, made to your device after it's um, been placed on the market. So Eric brings up a good point. You can keep that in mind. You can have two different sets of changes, but it's important to ensure you have those design change control procedures in place prior to the need for those procedures. Harsh, did that answer your question for the panel? Yes. All right. Yes, definitely. Excellent. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thanks for joining us. Let's get to our next emailed question. Uh, please discuss how a company may distinguish proof of concept slash prototype work versus product development, where design control requirements must be documented. And the second part is sometimes there's a tendency for the research and development department for this organization to blur this division. So it's, it's trying to delineate proof of concept slash prototype phase work versus product development. Um, so Eric, perhaps your thoughts on this question? Sure, and this relates a little bit to that question of when are design controls required to uh, be started. And so uh, the simple answer to it is, again, once you intend to put something on the market where you're developing something that, that will eventually be a product, you're no longer researching whether or not to develop something, um, is the delineation that's made in the preamble. Um, I would add to that that um, it's very important to look at when you really hit that mark because, because it's a good thing to define in your company, um, all right, when, when we've reached this, this point where we, where we have made this decision, we've reached this gate, um, that's when we're going to start the actual development process because, in part because there is that regulatory requirement that you do have a design and development plan put in place that you are following as you go through design and development. And if I can add something, because the prototype question comes up a lot and the whole concept of using prototypes. And while what you generally see is Earlier on, you'll see that use of prototypes. But, and the preamble speaks to prototypes as well. By the time you get to doing your final design validation, you should be using actual production units. Because the intent there is you want to make sure that there's nothing that's changing between that prototype that might have been tightly controlled in the research aspect versus the scale up to what you're actually going to put out onto the marketplace. And you don't want to have something that's either left out or changed that could then have a huge impact on that device once it's gone out to the larger public. 
And I would just add, though, in the event that you do decide to use prototypes during your design validation, you want to make sure that you document the differences with regards to the prototype device that you manufactured versus your, your actual product that you will have on the market. So in, in the event that you do decide to use those prototype devices, make sure you document the difference. We've got a couple of questions regarding uh, com components, suppliers. So here's, I think, a good one that will represent some of those questions. What kind of design controls are suppliers of components of medical devices, not the finished device themselves, required to follow? Um, so, Joe, your thoughts on this? Okay, so the question has to do with component suppliers. Yes. Um, they're not required to meet any requirements from a quality system perspective, they're required to meet the requirements of who they're providing to. So they actually, if from a regulatory standpoint, there's nothing from an FDA standpoint that we're going to really look at. But what they're going to have to deal with is the person who's coming and purchasing those components is going to put whatever requirements they deem necessary to ensure that those things are being looked at. So, for example, the way that FDA has looked at this because of resources as manpower is we can't go out and inspect every component supplier who might have a sub-supplier and sub-supplier up to there. We look at the finished device manufacturer and say, you as a finished device manufacturer under 820.50 purchasing controls are required to ensure that the suppliers you use and the components that you use meet the requirements that you need. And as part of that, during your design controls, it's a good idea to start qualifying what the design output that's going to be needed with regards to your suppliers and being able to then ask them to meet those specifications and requirements. And what I would add to that is that at the FDA, our expectation is that design controls are applied to the system. And because of that, that means that there is a design control obligation to that finished device manufacturer to understand the design of that component and how it fits into the system that they're using it in. And so really the expectation is that they are the ones who are establishing those requirements and putting them down onto the component manufacturer um, such that really everything is being developed in that systematic approach. Correct. And not all components are the same either. Using both risk and actually the regulation calls out essential design outputs, there are some components that you're going to probably look at a lot more carefully than others. Okay. Thank you, panelists. So our next question, um, is it essential to report to FDA any kind of changes in design that we've made? And if so, where can I find the supplemental form to report the changes to the FDA? <laughs> Tanya, your sure. thoughts? So changes to the design of a particular finished device that are required to be reported to the FDA, of course, depends upon the classification of that, that device. Um, if it's a Class II device, then you, we have several guidance documents um, that are available um, that address deciding when to submit changes to a 510K um, to the agency that will guide you through what changes, the types of changes that you make to your class two type of medical device that would require actually a new 510K. With regards to those devices that are classified as a class three or PMA, there's also a guidance document that's available that um, addresses when to submit supplements to a PMA that's been approved um, with the, to the agency. So there's several different scenarios. I would encourage you to um, look at those resources and then um, contact the agency uh, via DICE, D-I-C-E, um, for additional discussions regarding So essentially, that. in this case, mm -hmm. um, for this question, if you're thinking about making a change to a device, it may require FDA approval yes, prior, prior to, prior to thinking about implementing it mm -hmm. and uh, applying design control. So yes. you really have to think about it in, two, in those steps. Yes, prior and to marketing. Prior it. to marketing, yes. And one thing I just want to clarify is that for those Class three devices, the PMA devices, you're required to report all changes to the FDA. Um, even if it doesn't require a supplement, it still needs to be in your annual report. Yes. 
correct. And what I would do, and I would add one step further with regards to your design history file, if you go through the guidance documents and you decide that that change is something that doesn't need to be reported to FDA, I actually would document that as part of the decision process you use so that if you do have later on a discussion with FDA, you're not just saying, well, we don't know why we sent this 510K or why we didn't do it this time. You can actually go back and pull that document out to see the rationale behind the decision making that yes. was done. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. So our next emailed question, is it required to have a signature of independent reviewer for design reviews? Or is it sufficient to have uh, minutes of a meeting stating that the independent reviewer attended the design review? So the, the regulation does require that you document that design reviews were conducted and completed. And it does say that you, you do date and... and um, uh, approve those. So it doesn't specifically require the signatures, but you do have to document and, and proceduralize how you're going to confirm that those individuals were actually in attendance. So you may require the sign-in or an attendance sheet, or you may have a check mark of the list of, its, of attendees, so you get to define that. But you do have to have um, design reviews to be dated and approved. Correct. The signature okay. requirement mm -hmm. relates to the inputs and outputs. Yes. Specifically. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we have time for maybe one or two more qu quick questions. Uh, this has been a great session um, so far. Um, can you please explain the intent of the phrase validation or where appropriate verification in the design change section? So, Joe, you're... So, where appropriate is a term used throughout the regulation. And where appropriate means it's appropriate unless you can document a justification for why it's not. So the burden, when you're utilizing that term, it isn't just you decide hey, it's not appropriate for me. No, you have to go one step further and justify why it's not appropriate and document that justification. And to be clear, how you go about uh, making that determination should be very dependent on the nature of the change and how it affects the areas of design control that you're looking at. If that change really affects design inputs, for instance, then you may have to go through a lot of your design control process again in order to really evaluate how your design uh, is affected by that change. Whereas there may be other changes that don't require quite as, as many steps of your design control process to be revisited. Um, but again, as Joe said, that where appropriate um, statement really requires you to document your justification for what level of design control you decided to revisit. Correct. And, and the reason why I smiled for this is we get this question quite commonly. It, it's, it's, it's one that we answer a bit. So it's one that we see. And remember, design validation, that is the end point of how that device is going to work once it leaves your hands. That's why you're looking at it from an end user standpoint by the people who are going to be using it in its actual use environment. So it's really your last chance to make sure that you have everything right. So um, thank you, Joe and panels. We have time for one more question. It's a caller. So uh, James has joined the FDA panel. Thank you, James. Can you share your question with us? Yes, I can. Just a moment ago, one of the speakers, uh, the context was PMA changes. And some of those changes, we will need to have FDA's approval prior to implementing the change, which is, I'll say, distributing and marketing. But one of the speakers uh, seems to have said, and I may have missed this, that the uh, uh, request to change has to be done before we implement design control. And I just want to make sure I either misunderstood that or is that really FDA's position that we ask for permission first? So I, I think I spoke to the fact that when you're talking about a design change, um, certain changes trigger the requirement for a new pre-market submission. So for a class two device, that would be um, either an original PMA or more likely some type of PMA supplement. Mm -hmm. And you are and, required to obtain FDA's approval for those prior to implementing that 
finished device on the market with that change. Right. So you won't right. be able to right. distribute that product right. until that becomes FDA approved. Yes. And, and to clarify to your point, the expectation is actually that you have applied those design controls before you submit uh, that uh, supplement because without having applied those design controls, you won't really have the data to provide in the supplement that would be necessary to get approval. All right. Correct. I hope that clarifies that you're always going to do the design yeah. control aspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. James, that answer your question? Yes, it does. It clarifies it, that we All don't right. get permission first. Thank you we so much. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. Sorry. You um, so with that, and that's our last question. I'd like to turn it over to Joe for just a couple of final thoughts. Okay. Um, design controls still are a very important aspect. I know that there was a lot of discussion when they were added to the regulation in 1996, and they continue to be something that, as a, a regulator as well as someone who's followed medical devices for a long time, that this is your chance to make sure that the device is going to work as it's intended to work. And from an FDA standpoint, this relates back to our mission to make sure that safe and effective devices are on the market and thereby protecting the public health. And the whole aspect of design controls really speaks to that protecting of the public health. And I think all of us, both industry and um, FDA, have that responsibility to ensure that the devices are going to work the way they're supposed to. And that's pretty much my thoughts as well as others within the agency to why they're such an important part of medical device development. All right, thank you. And with that, Joe has the last word for today's session and the program. Uh, this now concludes the session on design controls and our overall industry basics program for today. If we didn't get to your question today, or if you have any new questions that come up in the future, please reach out to us at the Division of Industry and Consumer Education. You can email us at dice at fda.hhs.gov, or you can call us. And you can check out our website at fda.gov slash dic for all of our contact information. Please take a few minutes to fill out the survey about today's program. We really want to hear your feedback. Um, the survey will be listed at the website, and it really helps us design the programs in the future. Today's program, both the presentation as well as this live Q&A segment, will be posted to CDRH Learn in about a week. I'd like to thank the entire FDA team who put the program together, from our expert panelists, Tanya, Joseph, and Eric, to our FDA studio team who put on this production, as well as to the DIC team members who fielded your questions behind the scenes. And most importantly, I'd like to thank you, our audience, for joining us today. DICE is here to help you navigate the complex medical device regulatory landscape, so we look forward to helping you in the future. Remember, we're just a phone call or email away. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.